A British Airways flight takes off somewhere around the globe every 90 seconds. We fly to more than 200 cities around the world. Over 45 million passengers a year. A very, very big operation. Once the world's favourite airline... Good morning. Recent years have seen BA facing some turbulent times. Fresh allegations of dirty tricks. Massive disruption is thought to have been caused by a power surge. When we fail, of course we get criticism. The important thing is to learn from those mistakes and quickly. Competition in the skies has never been tougher and the stakes have never been higher. Competitors make us better. BA has to provide a better service. But now, in its centenary year, the company is setting off on a journey of its own. It's going to arrive a bit early. Earlier, the better. To transform itself back into the world-class airline it once was. Everything has changed, apart from our salt and pepper. It's a tough world now in aviation, so we need to move on. As British Airways begins its multi-billion pound makeover, our cameras have been allowed exclusive access to all areas of the business. From the factories where the airline buys its state-of-the-art jets... I just think aeroplanes are beautiful. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. ..to the engineers who keep them in the air. When you're working on a plane that weighs 300 tonnes, there's going to be problems as we go through. If you can play an Xbox, you can push out a plane. From trouble at the top... I get pissed off when people criticise VA. If someone criticises VA, they're criticising me. ..to the teams on the ground... One of the machines has broken down. Do you know how to turn this off? I can't turn it off. And the people who keep the passengers smiling. If we don't deliver, the airline doesn't deliver. In this episode, delivering the Dreamliner. How an airline gets its hands on one of the most advanced flying machines in the world. But will BA's latest purchase be grounded by red tape? Where is it? I have the original. There's a major menu overhaul. Has design manager Mark Tazioli got the right ingredients to turn around criticisms of cabin cuisine? What about dressings and stuff like yeah, that? So it needs to be practical for the crew. Just make sure I can open these up. Sometimes they're a bit dodgy. And flying start. Can the team in Osaka complete the finishing touches to a brand new route opening in the Far East without any glitches? I think they're suffering a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the parts got dented, and I think that's why. Thank you. <laughs> For an airline, one of the most important decisions it has to make is what planes to buy and when to buy them. And with each aircraft costing hundreds of millions of pounds, it's a decision that isn't taken lightly. There are orders for new aircraft placed, I would say every three to five years, by almost any major airline. There is a continuous effort to have access to the latest technology. Why? Latest technology is more efficient, is more sustainable, it is friendlier, it gives you more opportunities to provide a better customer experience. The airline is due to take delivery of 73 brand new aircraft over the next five years a shopping list worth billions of pounds. Gavin Shearer and his team are in charge of making sure all that money is well spent. And today he's in Seattle to complete the purchase of a new Boeing 787. And it's taken years of hard work to get to this point. Taking delivery of a new aircraft for British Airways is one of those jobs that you'd never dream that you would get. Been into aeroplanes since I was about two. Uh, you know, I've worked for British Airways for many years. Doing this, is, it's brilliant. The passenger jet industry is dominated by two global players, Airbus, based in Toulouse, France, and Boeing, the US giant of aviation located here in Seattle, Washington. This is the Everett production facility, once home to the legendary 747 jumbo jet, and now one of two factories producing the state-of-the-art 787 Dreamliner. This is one of the world's largest buildings. It's so massive that without proper ventilation, clouds would form in its roof. This cutting-edge facility delivers 12 completed Dreamliners every month. When they were designing the plane, the manufacturers went back to the drawing board, a decision that's transformed the business of flying. It's constructed unlike any other commercial airplane. The fuselage is, is, it, is almost entirely built out of carbon fiber reinforced composite. It doesn't corrode, doesn't fatigue, very strong, light. 
Instead of designing a huge aircraft that can carry 500 passengers, Boeing developed a smaller plane that's flexible, fast and efficient. The latest generation of Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 engines fitted to the 787 helped reduce the airline's annual £2 billion fuel bill and they've even been specially shaped to reduce noise. The wings are also made out of composite. We have several aerodynamic improvements on the wing, some electronic, some physical. You know, the raked wing tips, they provide additional aerodynamic improvements. So it was a new paradigm in manufacturing airplanes. It's 30 to 40% lighter than equivalent aircraft, say 767. Therefore, it obviously improves our fuel efficiency. But buying a commercial airliner involves a lot of red tape. And if it isn't done on time, Gavin and the plane won't be going anywhere, meaning delays to passengers and costs for the airline. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. Where is it? Coming up, the airline has a lot on its plate as it sets out to improve the food on board. Sometimes it's not been brilliant. What we're trying to do now is change people's perception of that. And a momentous occasion at Heathrow calls for a bit of last-minute crowd control. Steve's moving, we've got to go, come on, otherwise we're delaying the aircraft. One thing travellers could always expect from the airline was a free meal on every flight. But in 2017, the company shocked the travel industry when, like some European rivals, they stopped serving economy passengers free food on short-haul flights, replacing meals with the chance to buy Marks & Spencer sandwiches. We had a fairly poor proposition before that was free for all passengers. And when we looked around, the food provision model in short-haul aircraft across the world is the buy and board proposition. There's very few airlines left that actually give you free food. But for the flying public, it looked like the airline was putting profit before passengers. There was a lot of noise when buy on board was launched, but buy on board is not about cost cutting. Buy on board is about customer choice. So what we see is in short flights, uh, we have many customers who don't want to eat and also don't want to pay for it. It was a rough start because at the beginning we <laughs> didn't really prepare for how many passengers actually were going to buy the m and sandwiches that we rolled out. It took about a year and a half, but we now have the same degree of customer satisfaction that we had when we had free food. But even on long haul flights, where free meals were still provided, passengers were often unhappy with the standard of food that was served. The perception of airline food has taken a little bit of bad press. OK, you know, sometimes it's not been brilliant. A survey of over 7,000 passengers in 2018 awarded the airline just two out of five stars for its onboard food, one of the lowest scores of all the airlines surveyed. Something had to change. Enter menu design manager Mark Tazioli. What we're trying to do now is change people's perception of that. It's the cheapest marketing tool for an airline to get kind of loyalty of a customer and the, the airline shows uh, the customer that, that, that take really uh, care of them. But transforming the onboard food for an entire airline isn't as simple as choosing from a recipe book. Each day, the airline has to serve 100,000 meals in the sky. So the complexity of the company's catering operation is immense. There's about 200 menus flying around the world at any one time. That's a huge amount of that. We had to design in menus non-stop, more or less, throughout the year to cover the whole world. So Mark has a massive job on his hands. How do you provide quality food thousands of feet in the air? The journey starts in Vienna at international catering company Doe & Co. We choose to work with Doe & Co because they embody everything around food that we actually want to do. The culture is all around hospitality. Great food, great quality, great skills. They do event catering around the world. They run hotels, they have restaurants. All the dishes that we work with these guys on have been tested on the event circuit around the world, in Formula One or uh, in the hotels or in the restaurants. So we know that people like these dishes before they even come on board. I think in, in general everybody appreciates good quality, so why should you give bad quality if you can do the same? Uh, and many people say airlines or a plane is a limitation, which we do not believe. 
But getting food to taste delicious five miles up isn't always easy. The dry air and background noise in the cabin can actually reduce passengers' ability to taste, sometimes by up to 30%. And that isn't good news for a chef. One of the things that we do is try to make the food taste stronger, if you like, at altitude. So we did lots and lots of tests around different flavours, you know, different senses. The one that actually really helped us on board is umami, and that's the savoury taste. Things like tomatoes, mushrooms, very high in umami. We use herbs, spices, all these things to increase the flavour, to compensate for that 30%. Things like desserts will taste the same on the ground in the air, because that doesn't really change. It's that savoury savory flavour umami that changes. But with the airline flying to over 75 different countries across the globe, it's an awful lot of tastes to cater for. So, Chef's going to do some tandoori chicken now. This is great. This is the development kitchen. We've actually got tandoor in the development kitchen. We've also got this in the actual kitchen that we're going to produce from in London. Obviously, it gives it great flavours, cooked properly, very authentically. Things like curry will work very well on board because it's got the moisture. It's got the flavours, it's got the umami, it's got the spice in it. Uh, and we can up and down that, that as we go. We do different regions of China. You know, Singapore has its own menus. Um, you know, the Middle East has its own menu. So there's a huge variety. We do something like 17 or 18 different types of regional cuisine. Can we do the uh, stir-fried chicken black bean sauce, right, for Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Uh, let's, let, OK, let's put that together and then see how it works out. This is a very traditional Hong Kong dish. Okay. Uh, the black bean sauce. Um, if you go to Hong Kong, people will know this dish. It's, it's Straight away, yeah. right? Perfect. You see, there's got enough moisture in it, enough flavour. There's loads, loads of flavour in that. It's an ideal dish for, for eating on an aircraft. Yeah. Big dish. Yeah. Another one who wanted to be quite juicy. Well done, Chef. Good, Take it. good dish. It's a good dish. So, with the chicken and black bean sauce looking like it will appear on the menu soon, Mark wants to find a new meal for the premium economy cabin, or as BA call it, World Traveller Plus. World Traveller Plus is a really important cabin for us. From a food point of view, we're really making a step up. So today, we want to develop a nice pasta dish for World Traveller Plus. So let's try a mozzarella and a ricotta filling, and then we'll see which ones we like. If we like both, we can use them on future menus. Whatever class we develop pasta for is done like this. So, you know, fresh fillings made here. This is what you're going to see on the plane. Yes, we're going to cook it, we're going to add a sauce, we're going to add some garnishes to it, but this is what our customers are going to get. With another recipe signed off and ready to add to the new menu, Mark now has the mammoth task of making these dishes feed thousands of hungry passengers. But with just a few weeks before the recipes are due to roll out, has he bitten off more than he can chew? Over four and a half thousand miles away in Seattle, Gavin Shearer has the company checkbook and he's ready to buy a new plane with a list price of over 150 million pounds. It's an accumulation of, of lots of hard work, lots of people putting together, and to see that aircraft take off, it's, it gives you a big sense of pride. Today, Gavin is overseeing the delivery of the airline's latest 787 Dreamliner. Next generation aircraft like these are changing our expectations of flying by providing faster and more comfortable flights. The composite fuselage allowed us to put more pressure in the cabin, which literally means you feel like you are closer to sea level. And in our research, we discovered that between sea level and 6,000 feet, it's pretty much the same. Once you get above 6,000 feet, and, the, and you travel for long distances, then you begin to feel the kind of symptoms that people tend to associate with jet lag. Also, because a composite fuselage doesn't react to moisture the same way a metal fuselage does, it allowed us to 
have the humidity level be higher than you usually have in an airplane. You don't feel as dry. And that reduced the amount of symptoms of, of, uh, of headaches and nausea by a, by a tremendous amount. And finally, we used the electronic flight control system of the airplane to smooth out the ride. So we have reduced the, the amount of motion sickness on this airplane compared to other airplanes by a factor of eight. But getting your hands on a multi-million pound state-of-the-art jet isn't as simple as popping into your local showroom. Buying a commercial airliner actually takes years and involves months and months of analysis to decide what planes the airlines need and how much they're prepared to pay for them. Even when they have finally chosen a manufacturer and model, patience is the name of the game. Buying the right plane at the right time is incredibly important. Um, ultimately, you have to take the time. You have to do the analysis. You have to understand what are the different options that are available, not just the different manufacturers, but the options within each one of the different aircraft types. So a lot of work goes into that. Basically, what we're doing is we're, we're ordering slots on a, on a production line. So we normally see aircraft maybe three to four years after we place the order. Once you begin to get closer to making a decision, then you're fine-tuning. Is that particular version right for me? Is it not? Can I get uh, the right engine to go with that kind of aircraft? How is that going to work uh, internally together? Will it have a huge, massive impact? We go through all those motions pretty much every year, given all the new aircraft we're receiving. It's a time-consuming process. Every last detail of the plane has to be decided on ordered and fitted to make sure it's exactly what the company needs and the passengers expect. In-flight customer experience, flight crew, engineering, uh, cargo, they'll all have an input of how we configure this aeroplane. So ultimately they will decide what seats go in there, where the galley positions, how big the galleys are. So we basically will spec the aircraft from, from nose to tail. And hopefully all that hard work has paid off, as today's the day the airline is expecting to take ownership of their new plane. On the day of delivery, we'll obviously have said that the aircraft is, is technically sound. We've technically accepted the aircraft. Uh, we'll sign a number of documents in the morning, and then the money or, is, is transferred into, into Boeing's bank account. Once we've confirmed that that's gone through, get the all clear, and then the aircraft is, is, is technically ours. But before the new plane can join the fleet, Gavin faces a final hurdle. This is the DVLA part. So it's like registering your car once you've bought a car. So it's filling in your V5. The new jet has to be registered with the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK. Without its certificate of approval, the plane won't be allowed to fly home later today. This means a nervous wait for Gavin and his team. Where is it? I have the original. It's what I sell at least back the What, from the, the guy downstairs? Yeah. The aircraft can't fly until we've, we've completed this process. Despite the hold-up, downstairs the crew continue planning for the flight. OK, we're not on a track today. Staying quite normally, going over the rocky, so high terrain, and uh, going over uh, Greenland as well. Mm -hmm. OK. But they know that if the aircraft doesn't leave on time, it may miss the precious landing slot at Heathrow. And that would mean the plane's first commercial flight to Toronto in just three days' time is at risk. But at the last minute, Gavin gets some news. Hi, Sam. It's Gavin over at British Airways. Brilliant. That's great. Right. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye. So the certificate file is complete. We've got the certificate of registration, and we are good to fly home this evening. With the registration certificate received, payment safely in the Boeing bank account, and a ceremonial key to the plane handed over, only now is Gavin allowed on board to take a closer look. Welcome to our brand new 787. You can see the lights are dim, so on this aircraft here we have lights that, that dim automatically, electronically, so all controlled. Um, 7 to 232 configuration, so there's a really nice uh, seat in the middle there that's private, more room. It's one of my favourite seats if I'm lucky enough to travel in this cabin. Stepping up for the first time is is you get quite a buzz. The, the cabin is perfect. There's not a single mark anywhere. Uh, we all wear special overshoes, so we're not, we don't dirty the carpet. All the seats are pristine. Um, there isn't anything on board, and it has a kind of new car smell. The delivery of this plane will mark the 30th Dreamliner that the airline has bought from Boeing since 2015. After years of planning, the purchase is now complete, and Gavin's job is finished. Yay! 
The aircraft can now be handed over to the crew who will fly the plane on its nine-hour journey back to Heathrow. It's almost completely empty plane. We've got a couple of engineers on board with us today and the three crews, and that's it. First officer Sabine Hargreaves is one of the crew chosen to transport the plane to Britain. This is my first one and an extreme privilege to, to be able to come to Boeing Field and pick up a brand new 787. An amazing experience. But before takeoff, Sabine must perform a visual inspection of the aircraft, something that happens before any departure and a vital safety procedure. It is making sure we're not seeing anything unusual, for example, a gash in the tyres or any ratchets that could be open, make sure everything is as it should be. After a thorough examination outside and in, aircraft BJM is given a clean bill of health and can now officially enter service with British Airways as it finally begins the nine-hour journey to its new home. Coming up, passengers deliver their verdict on Mark's hard work. Hopefully it's something tasty, and if it's not, that's kind of disappointing. And tension mounts as BA launch a new route to Japan. Can I just take them to the securities? On any given day, there are around 7,000 planes in flight across the globe. With so many in the air, aircraft must stick to carefully defined flight paths. Guided by electronic waypoints and air traffic control, this keeps the routes as efficient and safe as possible. So, planning new routes is a complicated business for an airline. Setting up a new route for British Airways is one of the most significant investments we can make. Currently, the airline flies to 200 cities in 75 countries, and 2019 will see 13 brand new destinations added to that list from the US, Europe, and even the Far East. It is probably one of the attributes of, the, of this industry. We're very dynamic. We will adapt to the flows of passengers across the whole world. We fly to those destinations where our passengers want to fly to. But deciding on the destination is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole host of other factors that need to be considered before BA will fly to a new airport. We need to think about things that other people wouldn't realize. We need to think about the hotel makeup in the city, uh, where our cabin crew are gonna stay, catering arrangements, waste disposal, customs and border protection. There are a whole host of relationships we need to start building to get ready to launch a new route. Nearly 6,000 miles and 12 hours away by Boeing 787 is the Japanese city of Osaka, the latest destination for the airline. With demand for flights soaring, the company hopes to tap into the market, and the crews are just as excited as the passengers. I love coming to Japan. I, I come as often as possible. Quite often going to Japan, we go to about 72 degrees north, well into the Arctic Circle. This one's 77. And at night, we get the uh, Northern Lights very often beautiful but it, it'll be a smooth flight and most of it will be over Russia. Osaka's Kansai International Airport is built on an entirely man-made island and this feat of engineering handles 25 million passengers every year. It's a very busy airport. Um, we have a lot of visitors from Asia, China, Thai, and Air France and KLM fly with us and soon British Airways is going to fly in. BA's person on the ground is customer service manager Misako Yaji. Can I just take them to the securities? She has the epic job of making sure Kansai Airport is ready to welcome the first BA flight when it touches down in just over 24 hours. It's taken months to get to this point, and Misako has been responsible for everything from handling the media. Press briefing, 12.30, do you need to be there? No, just... To making sure there's enough food for departing passengers. I have a lot of responsibility to put the station up in time. We will have a soup option, mm -hmm. which would come, the soup would come with the garnish in there. Right. I'm sure every job is stressful, but it's quite exciting to see the new station start up from the scratch. Masako has worked hand in hand with the team in London, deciding on every detail of the new route, from which aircraft type will make the journey to what stationery the team needs. 
Okay, these are the boxes that arrived from London a few weeks ago. This is basically the stationary goods that needs to be um, used at the check-in. And then this is a box of blank boarding cards. Things like this is a roll of baggage tags actually, so it needs to be fitted in. And then you'll see a printed uh, baggage tag for this one. This is uh, needed for all the hand baggage and laptop baggage. So this needs to be um, delivered up the checking counter to be displayed. There are a few bits and pieces that we were still waiting for, like a baggage container tag. We absolutely need to know that they're going to be able to deliver the British Airways experience. We work hand in hand with the airport, whether it's baggage reclaim, arrivals processes, uh, even check-in procedures to make sure absolutely everything runs smoothly. Fine. I think our support team is bringing some things for us, so that should be fine. It is now um, 10 to 10, I think it will be. What we're doing now, this is the entrance for the check-in. Um, at the moment, it's not BA yet, but soon the check-in kiosk will be displayed with BA logo on it. And then we're going to have um, a display up there as well, be a log on it. But with less than 24 hours to touch down, there's still something vital missing from the check-in area. Just checking if the signage is going to go up, but I'm, it sounds like it's taking time. <laughs> With the arrival of flight BA-19 into Osaka getting ever nearer, time is in short supply. So Masako is on the hunt for her missing signs. Well, this is the, um, the baggage gauge that needs to be set up at the, at the checking counter, actually. This is for the customers to understand the size of the cabin baggage. Although it seems like a small problem, missing signs are potentially a huge issue. Confusion for passengers at check-in can cause delays, and for an airline, delays cost money and risk knock-on effects in the schedule, meaning inconvenience to potentially hundreds more passengers. I think they're suffering a bit. <laughs> <laughs> because it's been shipped, um, some of the parts is big, it got the little flames of it, uh, it got dented, and I think that's why I'm sure the boys here will be able to, to build it up soon. <laughs> Back in London, menu design manager Mark Tazioli is revamping the airline's in-flight catering. He has to make sure that the dishes designed in Vienna can be made in the numbers BA need to feed hundreds of thousands of hungry passengers. The recipes we've developed in Vienna are now starting to go into production here. So you're confident this is tasting the same as we had in Vienna, right? Yes. Exactly. 100%. This is more or less the same batch, right? It's, it's more or less the same, yeah. Very Everything similar. Everything we do here is the same. Yeah. Because we, we do have standard here, and you know, we follow the, the recipes. How many yeah. Of that and that. So it, translate, it translates yeah. from the development recipe right. straight into production, right? Straight away, yeah. We focus on individual client needs. So everything we have in mindset is the single guest, the single passenger, and is not the volume. If we do 1,000 meals, we are not doing once 1,000 meals. We do 1,000 times one meal. So every single dish is one passenger and is one opinion, and you have to make exactly the one passenger happy. And if you just think in volumes and in economies of scale, you simply cannot deliver the product which is expected. It's difficult to um, imagine that every dish is going to be the same, but there's certain processes in, in place to make sure that happens. Myself and the team visit kitchens that we're using around the world to make sure that every dish looks the same. There's pictures to guide uh, the staff. Uh, the recipes are written to aid that, and then it's checked by the chefs and make sure that they are what we wanted in the first place. Once the meals have been signed off, they are carefully wrapped and chilled before being delivered to the aircraft. The ultimate goal is that our customer's going to get on a plane and go, wow. So the next step for Mark is to find out if the cabin crew on board can do the meals justice when they're 35,000 feet up. And more importantly, what will the passengers think? Back in Japan, and it's the big day for customer service manager Misako and her team as they await the arrival of BA-19 from London Heathrow, the first flight on the airline's newest route. And with the flight already in Japanese airspace, there's no time to waste. 
It is now 10 past 8. The plane is on our way. So I'm just doing a little briefing with our staff before we go up to the check-in counters or at the gate. First job of the day is to check in with the airport's operations centre to see if the flight is on time. It's going to arrive a bit early, 9.30ish, they're saying. Earlier the better. <laughs> Next on Masako's list is to make sure her newly assembled signs are safely in position at the check-in area. And just in the nick of time, her colleagues arrive with the all-important missing luggage tags. Morning, how are you Finally, after months of preparation and with press and VIPs looking on, the inaugural Heathrow to Osaka flight arrives and taxis to its gate at the airport. Basically, I won't be on the ramp. I'll be up here, okay. uh, be around doing all the turnaround checks. Right, we're going because it's landed. I'm going to go over there. Excited. All my teams on the ramp is ready as well. So, yes. It's taxiing in to gate 36 now. Good. <laughs> we have our flags out from the captain's window, yes? To see the flag of Japan and United Kingdom flag, Union Jack, and to see the first aircraft coming in, yes, I feel very good. The passenger will disembark and then there will be cabin cleaning and there will be catering loading and there will be container loading, engineer checking aircraft, cargo checking all the cargo has been done. So that's, that's happening while passengers now being checked in and, and getting on, ready to board. The departure for the flight went smoothly. We had the flags out the cockpit windows and, and we had that for arrival into Osaka as well. Um, but yeah, it was a smooth, it couldn't have went um, any smoother really for the other With the flight safely landed, the team have only 90 minutes to prepare the plane for its 11-hour return journey as flight BA-19 becomes BA-20 bound for London Heathrow. But before takeoff, the small matter of a ribbon-cutting ceremony. British Airways opens the Kansai London direct flight. Kansai London Sen, Shuko desu. Please. Hello, Chris. Nice to meet you. How are you? Thank you so much. Captain Chris Hansen will be in the driving seat for this flight back to Heathrow, and he and his crew are well aware of how special it is. It is an honour, uh, and we do a few extra things. We've got some flags that we stick up. Um, and we have a few more things happening in the terminal, so it just gives you a bit of a buzz. So we all feel really proud to be here and really glad to be doing this. This market is set to grow. There is so much stuff happening here. There is so much excitement over here. There is so much buzz. Uh, and there's, there's just been a request for this route for such a long time. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think uh, it'll do really well. With the ribbon cut and the aircraft spruced up, the passengers can now be welcomed on board to begin their long haul flight to London. We've been working for this day for the, the last few months. Um, there was a lot of preparation, there's a lot of hard work, a lot of team uh, work together, and I think everything worked out really well the, on the day. It's not the end of the job. Uh, we will have another aircraft coming in tomorrow morning, and we need to dispatch the aircraft tomorrow morning again. So uh, it's, it's ongoing, it's ongoing. Do you want to try this one? Yeah, let's do it. Coming up, judgment day for Mark as the crew and passengers deliver their verdicts on his new menu. All I know is I was really hungry and I, I now don't feel so hungry. And a special arrival at Heathrow calls for a delicate touch. I imagine because it's brand new paintwork, he's being extremely careful. The big day has arrived. For months, Mark and his team have been designing and testing new meals that they hope will feature on the new in-flight menu. And today, they get to see what the passengers make of their hard work. So we're gonna look at it on the flight today, see what the feedback's like from the crew, the customers. Um, hopefully they love it. Uh, we're gonna try out the flavors on board and see how it performs in the cabin. 
But before takeoff, the Doe and Co team arrive to check the correct number of meals are on board for that flight. The chill dishes are all safely stored away until the plane is in the air. Once the captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, the food is heated in specially designed convection ovens. When the meals reach the correct temperature, they are added to individual trays ready for service. Right, that's the plus trolley. Just leave the top to go on that. A quick change into his chef's whites, and Mark can talk cabin crew member Jason through the new dishes. One great pasta uh, with mozzarella, some tomato in it, freshly made. And then the other one is uh, stir-fried chicken with ginger, chili, specifically made for a Hong Kong route. So let's, let's see what our customers think. Yeah. I had the uh, chicken, chicken stir-fried. It was good. Very nice sauce. It was really hot and good. And the rice was good, which is not easy. The seven-hour flight is not the most riveting of occasions, so you kind of look forward to the food and hopefully it's something tasty. And if it's not, that's kind of disappointing because you're whiling away the time. Um, but yeah, no, I was particularly hungry today, so that definitely hit the spot. I like the spicy stuff. This was light, fresh. A bit of chilies on it would have been good for me. <laughs> it was great. I think I'd like a little more spice on that. I like the, the bit more hot temperature. Uh, but it was the nicest chicken dish I've had on the plate. So. I typically stay away from the pasta on a plane because it tends to be a little bit rubbery around the edges, but that was perfectly done. It was a nice bit of cheese. So it was, yeah, it was very tasty. It was really good, but I think it's a little bit bland for my taste buds. So we've had feedback. Generally, people really, really liked it. With the pasta, and some people said, OK, it's, it's slightly bland. You know, we can look at the recipe and look at what, you know, whether we add a sharper cheese to give it a bit more uh, flavour in here. I think we had some comments around the chicken that we need to just add, maybe add a little more spice to get it right altitude. Usually you just get a piece of chicken and some, something that looks like a potato. And, but this was a nice, this was nice. It felt like, you know, Chinese delivery in the sky. It was good, except the chopsticks would have been better. Seriously. But... <laughs> back in London, and it's a special day for the airline. To mark their 100th anniversary, a Boeing 747 has been repainted in the original British Overseas Airways Corporation colours, and the plane is about to land at the airport. It's a sight that's not been seen here at Heathrow since 1974. Staff, past and present, have joined the press to indulge in a spot of nostalgia. Good morning, gents. How are we doing? Oh, excellent. Glad to hear it. Right. Project manager Dave Tubb and his team have a jumbo-sized job on their hands, making sure this giant of the skies with its 60-metre wingspan not only lands safely, but gets into the hangar. No, we are not doing too much. Well. We are not the rugby team. We go to the We're hosting around 100 press and staff who are coming in to see the arrival. And everyone's very excited about it because we haven't done anything like this before. This is the first in a series of BA planes to be given this retro paint job, all in celebration of the airline's long and illustrious history. I think we are almost the oldest airline in the world. We can trace our history back to virtually just after the First World War. We have had a huge effect on flying across the world. The brand British Airways as we know it first took off in 1974, following the merger of BOAC and British European Airways. British Airways operate the largest passenger fleet in the Western world. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of British European Airways. Since then, the airline has built its worldwide reputation on all things British. Good off British weather, eh? But conditions at Heathrow haven't dampened anyone's enthusiasm as Dave and his team prepare to welcome the new arrival, Speedbird 100. Uh, Speedbird 100, it's great to see you back at BOAC. From all of us here at NAP Set Traffic Control, happy birthday and congratulations on 100 years of flying. That was fantastic, I'd love to see it come in. Something to come a long way to see that aircraft. 
However, before celebrations can begin, Dave has to make sure it's safe for the invited guests and media to approach the 300-ton plane. Now we just need to get everyone into a good position to get, hopefully, some really good photographs. It's going well. I imagine because it's brand new paintwork, he's being extremely careful. He's just starting to scratch the paintwork now. The paint job on this Boeing 747 took a week to complete. Paint adds weight to the aircraft, and more weight means more fuel burn, so the old paint is stripped back before 125 litres of new paint is sprayed on. With the last photos taken, it's time for Dave and the team to get Speedbird 100 indoors for the night. And when you're dealing with an 80 meter long 747, there's no room for error. Steve's moving, we've got to go. Come on, otherwise we're delaying the aircraft. <laughs> right, just made two free umbrellas. But Dave's got a problem, as the over-enthusiastic crowd are clamoring to get their shot of this queen of the sky. Please, 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 please move. We're not moving until we get him out of the way. We all good? Bring it in. It's gone really, really well. Everyone was very excited, but part of our problem really was getting everyone inside because everyone just wanted to stay out there. Beautiful, doesn't it? It does look absolutely amazing. And it takes, it takes you back all those years to when it, when it first appeared. When I first joined all those years ago, that was the logo. And I've heard people saying today how nicely to see it again. That BOC livery means a awful lot to me. And it just conjures up all those memories of the really golden ages. First class, for instance, we had joints on board and we carved them and we had like a rotary order and things like that. Everyone that was here from, from BA seeing it was, uh, it was a very proud moment for us to, to see her coming in. I was thinking before, you know, there you are sitting in a departure lounge and suddenly this turns up rather than a, a normal British Airways aircraft and just remind us really about the, about the pioneering because BOEC did pioneer long distance flights after the war. Uh, and through the 70s. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now unfasten your seatbelts and smoke if you wish. We shall be serving you with cocktails and lunch and afternoon tea. We shall also be very happy to serve you with any drinks and cigarettes you may require. It's a reminder that, you know, air travel has come a long way in a fairly short time. You try and be all calm and collected about this sort of stuff, but yeah. there is something quite beautiful, absolutely quite beautiful. Tomorrow, the plane will fly its first passengers to JFK Airport in New York. Significant, as this is the first route the 747 flew in BOAC colors back in 1964. And it will remain in its new livery until it finally retires in 2023. Next time on Inside British Airways, the engineering team begin a supersized makeover on one of the fleet. The guys know we've got tight time constraints, but that can't be at the sacrifice of any safety or any quality. We can do everything in our power to make sure this thing doesn't go late. The airline waves goodbye to an old friend. The dear old 767's had her time, but she has been such a workhorse for us. And the company has a fight on its hands to win back the luxury market. It is absolutely critical that we stay ahead of the curve.